but part of the task of the World Business Academy has always been and still is to um, help create a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue about where we can go even as we celebrate where we have been. And in the context, context of doing that, uh, here at the SRI conference in the prior years, and hopefully for years to come, we try to introduce at least one person who we'd like you to hear from, who maybe even someone you know really well already, which is the case today, but to hear from them in the context of something that will hopefully challenge you and give you an opportunity to engage at a much more deep and permanently committed level on this incredible mission that we've all selected together to move the needle. And we've got quite a planet that's ready for us to help move that needle, as you'll be hearing shortly. Well, it's my joy to today be introducing my uh, co-panelists who are, come on up if you would, Mindy. Uh, this is old home week for Mindy, because Mindy, you all know Mindy Luber, right? So, yeah. You may not know, she started as an environmentalist when she was 14, recycling the town garbage. Of course, you know, she's got a JD, a Juris Doctorate, an MBA. Uh, she has uh, been uh, involved with uh, the Massachusetts PERG and then went on to form an interesting uh, green century capital management. But in 2003, she became president of Ceres. And for the last nine years, uh, has been really moving that organization with incredible skill. Uh, I thought it, it's hard to introduce somebody to you who you know so well. So I thought I'd just read two things that I th would be very interesting, and then we can get into the conversation. What is Ceres about? Well, it's about introducing a bold new vision to the business community, a vision of a world in which business and the capital markets promote the well-being of human society and the protection of the Earth's environment. Now that's a lofty goal, and many people would subscribe to it. What makes Ceres so different is the extraordinary competence that Mindy has brought to that. And if you haven't seen the uh, sustainability conference that she just did again, the fifth year, I believe, at the UN, I urge you to take a look at it. It's online. And you'll see the kind of work that she's bringing the biggest leaders in, in the world of capital markets, the biggest leaders in the world of politics, and the biggest leaders in the world of business together to commit to and actually achieve these objectives. And she does it because she's a scholar, prolific. She writes a great deal and she appears constantly. And I was just looking before I came down here, I, I pulled from the website some, just a few you know, head notes here. So the Global Reporting Initiative, I think you all are familiar with that, 1,800 companies now involved. Um, she was instrumental in getting the, the fuel economy standards raised, the CAFE standards. Uh, that the Obama administration just did, and I'm really pleased because in my last book uh, five years ago, that was the number one recommendation that we made, raise the fuel standards. Nothing will do more to get us off foreign oil. She's um, presented this interesting thing called the 20th First Century Corporation, the series roadmap for sustainability in 2010, and then came up with uh, the road to 220, 2020, corporate progress on the series roadmap for sustainability, and looked at 600 companies that had actually taken that roadmap. So it's one thing to be able to write about it. It's another thing to be able to measure it, to benchmark it. And I'll end my introduction of Cindy by just saying that, Mindy, by saying this. I took and pulled some of the reports that Ceres has produced just this year. I'd like you just to listen to the titles, and then I'm going to sit down. Stormy futures for U.S. property casualty insurers, the growing costs and risks of extreme weather events. Supplier self-assessment questionnaire, building the foundation for sustainable supply chains. Sustainable extraction, an analysis of SEC disclosure by major oil and gas companies on climate risk and deep water drilling risk. Deep benchmarking error emissions of the 100 largest electric power producers in the United States. Global investor survey and climate change report. Clearing the waters, a review of corporate water risk disclosure and SEC filings. Physical risks from climate change, a guide for companies and investors on disclosure and management of climate impacts. Investor risks from oil shale development. Restoring flows, financing the next generation of water systems. A strategy for coalition building. The road to 2020. Practicing risk-aware electricity regulation, what every state regulator needs to know. 2012 Investor Summit on Climate Risk and Energy Solutions, the final report. Fuel economy focus, industry perspectives on 2020, charting new waters, financing sustainable water infrastructure, 
and infrastructure and institutional investors' expectations of corporate climate risk management. That was all 2012. You get the picture? We have in front of us one of the great pioneers of this industry and a pillar of the work that we're all engaged in. It is such a sincere and great honor to present Mindy Limber. That was rough. <laughs> Always tough to listen to that kind of stuff. Well, why don't you start with a little bit of history. Great. And um, the context of this conversation, I think, is what can we do, capital markets, as you heard, a serious goal, capital markets, businesses, society, how do we come together to change the future? Great. Uh, thank you, and, and you could all forget that opening. Uh, I, I want to turn this around a bit, um, and I want to start with the fact that this is my community, this is my family. Extraordinary congratulations to the folks who put this conference together. I've been at many, 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 but I'm going to share one experience. Uh, I bet half the people in this room were with us when 9-11 hit. We were all in Arizona. It was about the most painful thing we can imagine as a community. Uh, and I have never seen a community come together more brilliantly, more humanely, whether it was a religious session that I think Tim Smith walked us through or Steve or everybody in the room came together to think about how do we address, how do we think about, how do we mourn, how do we live what we were experiencing. And there is no finer community to be part of uh, when that kind of tragedy hits. Everything from how we warned and, and some of the uh, religious leaders, part of the investor religious group, the IRC, um, who forced us to dance and to sing just to celebrate those who died. Or the group of people that organized the bus that I was on, 70 hour bus ride, um, from Tucson, I think we were in, to Boston, uh, but we wanted to get home to our families. You have a lot of disagreements on a bus for 70 hours <laughs> with 30 people. You could. We had nothing but the kind of goodwill and the kind of extraordinary vision that people in this room bring to this room every year and bring to the work that you do. Uh, it's an extraordinary community. So from uh, the 9-11 to the rest, uh, you are the people who I think making the difference, and thank you. Uh, I'm going to walk down memory lane very quickly. I want to talk about power, vision, success, leadership, and then tell you despite the fact that collectively we've met with success, building power, leadership, vision, we've only just begun. And I want to quickly switch to the challenge we face and the fact that I remain keenly optimistic that we could take on that challenge because of people in this room. I want to start by saying one of the most powerful levers of change, and if anybody in this room disagrees, see me outside, we'll have a duel, no, we'll discuss it, um, that capital markets forcing change, the power of investors with companies, not all hostile, not all about campaigns, but making the case for treating workers humanely as they so well deserve, or dealing with our resources adequately, or addressing climate change, or dealing with the kind of injustices we saw in South Africa. Those are as much economic issues as they are humanitarian, environmental, national security, public health issues. There are issues. And the reality is this community has put those issues on the agenda as eloquently, as adequately, as effectively, and I would argue in many cases more effectively than any other community. And I spent 30 years running advocacy organizations as a regulator, running an EPA, you know, so I've been part of a litigation community, an enforcement community, an advocacy community, even a political community. I tried to get Mike Dukakis elected uh, to president. You saw how that ended up. And I will tell you to this day, literally when we were walking the halls of the United States Congress, to try and get the right market signals in place around climate change, a price on carbon, because carbon pollution has a price to society. Nobody was listening to my colleagues in the environmental community. They were listening to the investors, small, medium, and large investors alike. So I don't know if people fully look at the big picture every day. We're all busy. We're running around. We're doing our jobs. 
But the vision of the social investment community of Joan Bavaria, who founded the Social Investment Forum and series, far more visionary than anything I could ever imagine, um, who said our job is to integrate sustainability into capital markets at a time where people laughed at that and thought it was not going to happen. Think about how that vision has been catapulted by the people in this room to build power to get successes. Let me just throw out a few things. I mean, think about the South Africa divestment movement and what it accomplished. Yes, that was about antagonism, and it was about just addressing risk and less on the opportunity side, and I want to come back to opportunity. But what made that community successful? What made that campaign successful? What got the very real results? It was this community, and I bet half the people in this room were part of that through engaging investors to make the case that we needed to treat people differently, we needed a different humanitarian perspective, and that was part of building a future and building an economy. And think, people then still thought, this is a little niche, it's never going to grow, it's the radical investors, it's a small group, uh, they'll always do campaigns, the campaigns will be great, but, but that's not about real change. And let's just look at three or four or five things that we've done together as a community. Um, Ronaldo mentioned GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative. All of us said, as investors, we need more information. We need to know what are the metrics that are driving companies. And who came together in the room that my predecessor built and put together? Investors led that campaign to build a framework, a comprehensive framework, 800 stakeholders involved in it, that was about how do you measure sustainability footprints, because what gets measured gets managed, and that does change the dynamic. So Ronaldo had, and shame on us for having an old number on the web page, there are now 6,000 multinational companies using the Global Reporting Initiative. Is that enough? No, I'm going to come back on talking about how we got to scale. But that would not have happened, not for a minute, not a chance, without the people in this room saying, we need that information. Information about social and environmental and governance issues are as fundamentally important as any other issue in a financial statement, and companies should have to understand that, measure it, manage it, put it out to investors, and it will get used. Didn't happen because activists came together, the driver in every instance was this community. And extraordinary, or think about the SEC. The SEC now mandates the disclosure of climate risk in their 10Ks. We knocked on their door for years. It wasn't until we and a large group of investors went and looked at the financial risks from climate change and talked to every commissioner and everybody in that building and every staff person, well, they have 2,200 people. We didn't talk to everyone in the building. Um, but it was this community, the investors who were sitting in this room, who made the case that we need to have more disclosure within the legal filings, the 10Ks, which we're all geeky enough to read. Um, but it was because people in this room said we need that. And the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, in three states, they requiring 92% of the industry to disclose the material risk of climate. For five years, we tried to move them on that. It was the last two years when investors were in the room on every day of those discussions that the National Association of Insurance Commissioners or the three leaders from California, New York, and Washington State said, yeah, I guess if it cost the insurance industry $32 billion last year, from climate-related costs to the property and casualty, that's probably a risk we should know and we should, should see disclosed. But nobody wanted to do it. And investors making the case that that's material information that we need to act to change was what pushed them over the edge. The list goes on and on, whether it's the 150 shareholder resolutions just that we see on sustainability reporting, on climate risk. It's all of you leading those fights. And you know what? Companies talk about that everywhere I go. When we do training of corporate boards, the first thing they ask is, will this mean I won't get a shareholder resolution? Or are those folks going to come knocking on my door? Uh, and not all of it is fear. Some of it is they just don't want to see that. But the shareholder advocacy that this community has done has changed the debate in corporate boardrooms, and we see it every day. <coughs> I could give you hundreds of examples. And think about the other investors that are now in the game. We work with not only so many of you, but some of the largest public pension funds. Many of them are in this room. CalPERS, who's looking at their 
governance and how do they describe governance and when they meet with companies, why they now say to companies, you need to be integrating environmental and social and governance issues beyond some of the financial issues to prove to, this, to us you're managed well. Well, CalPERS is at $200 billion under management now, 180, uh, they're here. Uh, or BlackRock, largest asset management firm in the world, they now, but again, now, you all have been doing it for the last 20 years. You all have been thinking it, building it, providing the movement. I look around, I see Joe Keefe, I see the leaders of this community who have been thinking about this and had the vision. So whether it's investors following suit, companies absolutely hearing, regulators listening and acting, standard setters like GRI making a difference, even policymakers who say to us, we don't want to hear from the advocates, we want to know what the impacts of these issues are on the economy. Everybody is focused on the economy. So the short history story is this community has been as effective as any that I've ever studied in building power, in moving a vision, in making change. We're now seeing business schools wanting to think about how to deal with the financial implications of sustainability. So I want you all to give yourselves a round of applause. This community has made more change than anything I have seen, uh, and you're extraordinary. But very quickly, and then Renaldo and I are going to move into a discussion, I want to say that's great. And none of us should be satisfied resting on our laurels. We're still driven by a fossil fuel industry. We still have slave trade in our workplaces. We still have unfair practices. We still have boards of directors that aren't listening to outside stakeholders. We still have an economy that's going from 7 billion to 9 billion people where we do not have enough resources, we do not have enough food, we will not have enough water, and climate change may never let us get to 9 billion people at the same time. Those are the world's leading economic issues, I would argue. Again, not only environmental, public health, national security, they will drive our economy. The public policymakers are all looking at the economy. It is this community, again, who will drive those issues to either success or we will fail and fail hard. But we can't build a world of 9 billion people. We can't build a sustainable capitalism where the investments of trillions of dollars, 40 to 60 trillion dollars now going into oil sands uh, in Alberta, Canada. Every scientist tells us that will be game over when it comes to emissions. How do we move that $40 billion to renewables and to energy efficiency? It's not an option anymore. We need to move those things. We need to change the capital flows. How do we put price, a real price, on carbon pollution? How do we price water appropriately? We're not wasting it, but we're also not denying it from people who deserve to have it and need it to survive. I would argue to integrate sustainability into capital capital markets to see the kind of change in companies where we no longer accept one-off deals, where they've done one good project and we're supposed to say, aren't you great? It's the comprehensive thinking. How do you integrate sustainability at the board level? How do you tie compensation to it? How do you integrate it into R&D, into enterprise risk management, into facilities, into products, and to supply chain? And the only one who can make that happen is this group, and this group beyond. We can't have this as a special niche, that this is about social investing. This is about the economy. It is about putting real prices on the economic issues that drive the economy. And we need to be thinking about how to bring more investors into the debate, how to move companies. And the very companies that are doing a little bit, how to get them to do a lot. And the companies that are doing nothing have to begin addressing fossil fuels, water depletion, lack of natural resources, because there is no part of, no sector of our economy that can survive without enough water. The drought of just this past year, we decimated the agricultural community in the middle of the country. Some people think implications of climate change are only on the coasts. Well, the corn crop dying or the cotton crop dying, <coughs> dying in Texas wasn't about the coast, it was about the core fundamentals of our economy. So together, thinking about how do we get this out of a boutique niche, this is about the core of the economy. Nobody should think it is a special part of assets. It needs to be driven into every asset class of every asset owner, and every asset manager has to know how to model it and think it through and analyze the risk 
and ask the questions on the quarterly earnings calls? And how do we move the levers around us? The stock exchanges are talking about demanding more information and requiring more information on ESG issues. We need all of us calling for that. And the ratings agencies are starting to look at how do we integrate water risk and climate risk into what they do. It will work if we're all there. And the policymakers who were stalled in Washington need to understand that addressing climate, addressing water issues are the fundamental future of our economy, both addressing the risk and looking at the future. So we know we have some big structural problems. We're driven in a world by short-termism. We want to think about the world in a slightly longer way. Uh, there are many forces that drive short-termism, not the least of which is compensation of money managers. But if we've changed as many things as we have, and that list is about what you all have accomplished, we could change how we look at quarterly earnings, or do we ask companies to stop disclosing quarterly guidance? There are ways to address the largest problems. They're real, but they're also fundamentally manageable. So great start in the first 20 years of this community and this movement, and truly from the bottom of my heart, as well as intellectually, this is the community has made as much change as any that I've seen. Uh, but I would say we're done patting ourselves on the head. We should feel good about what we've done. Uh, but we really need now to turbocharge everything we've thought about, move things faster, better, smarter, comprehensively. Uh, and if we do that, we might actually build a future for our children. I will tell you I am bullish and remain optimistic that we can despite the threats. And I'm bullish and optimistic because of you all. So thank you. And uh, let's tangle with some of these issues with a very smart guy. Well, you know, you, you started, it, it actually used the word twice. It, it, it was a, it's a boutique kind of industry. Uh, and, and it was at one point. And I almost feel like we ought to declare our maturation. We, we are not a small part in SRI of what was going to be a good idea and that has outperformed the market. I think we should really address the fact that it's time to see ourselves as the new mainstream. We are the new mainstream. And, and I'd like to hold out for the group here that one possibility, a way to see that, is to get past the roots of this organization and this, this movement as a series of thou shalt not investment strategies so thou shalt not invest in military, nuclear, whatever. And now flip that to what are the thou shalts. In other words, start supplying, from a capital markets point of view, the oomph and the emphasis that lots of people in the C-suite that I deal with are looking from support from share owners on companies that are good trying to be better. And I'm just wondering, do you find that with the series companies? You know, we're getting there, but collectively we have to listen to Ronaldo, who's in the boardrooms, who's a very smart business guy, who's not sitting here from a niche community or a niche chair and saying, this is what we're thinking about in the boardroom. Yesterday I was at a conference on Wall Street and board members were saying, we now are starting to look at how to integrate climate. Prudential just put a requirement for any new board member they know how to think about sustainability, and they look at the opportunities as well as the risk. So we're not quite there, but Ronaldo's point is right. We need to declare it there. This is not a niche. This is not an environmental issue or a social issue or a do-good issue. Our economy cannot grow, cannot survive, will not survive without integrating sustainability across our capital markets. And as Ronaldo said, in the we shall do. So it's not only about stopping fossil fuels. Coal-fired power plants, in fact, are killing themselves on their own weight right now. Nuclear power plants, which Ronaldo is an extraordinary extra expert on, can't, there will be no more built at the $8 billion price tag, and we're seeing that. But how do we take that $40 billion in tar sands, which will be game over, and find a way to move that $40 billion into efficiency into renewables and into building a future that will be about jobs here in the United States, that's about clean energy, and that's not about emissions that will move us well beyond the tipping point as it relates to climate change. Yeah, yeah, Muhammad Yunus did a wonderful thing last night for everybody who was in the room. Uh, he was in a rare form because not only was he covering the Grameen Bank, but then he went on to act like the quintessential entrepreneur and tick off example after example of ways we could support 
creativity in the business model addressing, and he called it for social businesses, but addressing these issues that are confronting us and giving us an opportunity sheet in front of us that's limitless because there are so many challenges to be solved. And I just want to touch for a second on one of them in the sense that he sees every economic challenge as a human rights issue, basically. And if, if we take the thou shalt to that level, here's the thing I've done many times in the last year or two and, and seems to get pretty much universal agreement. I'm going to tick off a few things, and I'm going to suspect that every single person in this room will agree with each one of these, what I'm going to call human rights. And if we do, then I'm going to ask the challenge is, so how do we create these human rights using the capital markets? That's where the real game is, because business no longer can be on the sidelines watching these issues get resolved. Business has to be the agent of resolution. So I think all of us would agree that it is unconscionable. It's a human right, literally, that every human being born on the planet should have access to potable water, adequate potable water. Every human being should have access to adequate food, to adequate shelter, clothing, adequate medical care, non-gender biased education, and the freedom from violence collectively or individually in their own personal safety. Now, we all think, does anybody disagree that those are human rights? And yet, across the globe, those human rights are not supported. And yet, we in business literally could see to it as our mission that all seven will occur. Well, how does that tie to SRI investing? It seems to me that if we put ourselves in the thou shalt mode, not just to do for free, as Muhammad Yunus was saying last night, but using a purely capitalist model. I mean, we love Walmart. I mean, Walmart did not go to energy efficiency and to dominate the, the, the explosion of LED lamps across the nation and the world. It didn't do that because it was trying to be a nice guy. We all know that. It did it to make a lot of money. And it turns out the most money you make is when you do the most good for the most number of people. Here's my final example, 1947 passed by one vote of the U.S. Congress, would not have passed with its original name, which was going to be called the Truman Plan, so they changed it to the Marshall Plan, and it passed by one vote. The idea was, let's keep Germany and Japan from going to war with us again, even if they never like us. And we're going to go rebuild the vanquished. In the process of doing that, and here's a number we should remember for this year's election, we were at 200% GDP, debt to GDP. Now, we had a debt to equity ratio that was so out of whack that no one even looked at it, because they said, we just got to get up. The war's over. We got to get on with life. And of course, that GDP ratio plummeted from 1946, 47 to 1966, 67, and continued to go down slower after that. So we took private capital and rebuilt the world. In the process, look what we did for the stability of our, of our nation and ultimately our own personal wealth. So what I think we want to talk about is how do we get the capital markets to see Clearing those seven rights and making them real is the future. How do we do it? A, a, a good question. I mean, and there are, there are many, many answers. But one thing is, we do need honest capital market signals. If we send the wrong, capital markets are fairly smart. People like you all who work within capital markets, you build decisions, make decisions based on analysis, based on data, based on you know, what makes sense? Right now, we send all the wrong false signals. Take climate change, which really is one of the world's great economic issues, and will define the future of not only our grandchildren, but our children and our lives as we know them today. Um, right now in the United States, we price carbon pollution at zero, as if it doesn't have a cost to society. Last I checked, the cost is quite dramatic. So we've got to start when we look at, when we expect capital markets to work, we've got to get the signals right. And it really is price things in a way that speak to the cost of the issue, which will drive less investment in fossil fuels and more investment in the, what our future should look like. But unless we put the right policy implications in play, the wind tax credit, take something as simple as extending the production tax credit. We have heard from almost every wind energy business person, not advocates, that the Congress just needs to extend the tax credit that has existed, but has this up and down life, for two or three more years to allow them to build an industry, which will be about 
clean energy. It'll be about jobs here at home. It will be about manufacturing. It'll be about sales. Um, and right now, we don't have a Congress who's willing to do that. And we may very well lose the production tax credit. We may try and pass it next session. I would argue the best advocates for that are you all. I mean, people dismiss the wind energy industry as somehow their special interest. They are. The fossil fuel industry has had subsidies for 50 years. Nobody's taking them away, giving them back. So one thing is we do need to get the pricing signals right as a start. We also need to integrate sustainability into the levers of capital markets. Why is it that the stock exchanges ask for lots of information that run to the viability of a firm, but not sustainability metrics? We need to join together. Right now, we have NASDAQ, quite interested, but they need to hear from hundreds of us, and we need to work together to get them to say these issues. The SEC needs to enforce and needs to say, not only do we need to seek disclosure of climate risk, but on ESG risks more broadly, so people have the information. Information changes and drives behavior. Uh, we've got to put the right policies in place, the right market signals in place, and then I think we've got a shot. I mean, think about compensation. We compensate money managers, and frankly, most people in industry, on the most short-term time frames. So if you're compensated on how did you do yesterday, or did you make, or your stock's rising, and what does the last three months look like, or six months, it's very hard to look at the real cost of sustainability. On the other hand, if we move those metrics out, we might actually have a shot at it. I know that many in this room think long-term. That's what you do. That's what most of your businesses do. But how do we make that a mandate? What we need to show is that the economics of water. McKinsey says that in 2030, we will have 40% less water than we need to run our world. 2030, it'll be about 25% less. And we're already seeing it in many places today. What business or industry or company that you're invested in doesn't need water to exist? How do we integrate those things so we're actually, companies are using water well and stewarding water well rather than all of us. And there's not a devil here, the way we've priced water. We all love to waste it. Uh, we've got to send the right market signals. Yeah, and so this gets now back to the thou shalt. So when we invest in companies that are trying to do the right thing and encouraging them to expand further into that direction, those companies, for their own personal reasons that are absolutely academic and appropriate, will pursue it. What you'll find, though, and it's, it might seem surprising to this audience, in the, in the boardrooms, in the C-suite, um, there's little support for doing the right thing. There's enormous support to listen to the quarterly demands of Wall Street, the monthly demands of Wall Street. But there's very little support from you all. So part of what we wanted to come out of this conversation with is shareholder advocacy is not just beating up on the bad guys, so to speak, although that certainly has its place. It's really increasingly about supporting the good guys and women to do the right thing and to expand into all these new areas. So taking advantage, she just, in a glancing way, mentioned, uh, Mindy mentioned the, uh, the SEC. Well, the fact that we now have the requirement in a 10K to respond, what are you gonna do about climate change, is a huge opening. I have not received, and I sent on a Fortune 1000 uh, New York Stock Exchange Company board, I have never received one letter or email from anybody in this room asking me what I'm doing about that. Not one, and I'm on the audit committee. Now, I just wanna point out, I'm not alone. None of us in the C-suite and the boardrooms actually hear from you folks. So if we did, they would give us a way to go back into that boardroom, back into the C-suite and say, hey look, we got some stakeholders here. The capital markets figured out if we do something smarter, we could do something a lot better for our shareholders because it's just good economics. And I think that's what Mindy's really trying to advertise and promote here. And think about it. Think about the SRI road shows that somebody mentioned. Uh, I think my colleague from Dell, who eloquently talked about a terrific capital markets program where they take back computers, so the toxic chemicals don't end up in our landfills, in our water, and they have found ways to make that a very important, viable part of their business strategy. But part of those discussions came up in discussions with investors. Uh, we need to see more of that, and, and it, uh, look, 
This is the group that's doing it, so nobody should be saying, you know, what we need to do is tenfold. The fact of the matter is we hear from corporate CEOs every day saying, we want to hear more from analysts. On their quarterly earnings calls, nobody is asking about sustainability. Now, the road shows that this group is doing and that we're doing within this community are asking those questions, and they're being heard and they're making a difference. We need to keep doing them, and we need to get them integrated, the questions, the activity, into all of the analysts. Um, road shows on a quarterly basis. Companies shouldn't say, this. we're not hearing about this from our investors. Investors are amongst the most powerful, the most capable and nimble folks for trying to integrate these arguments. So you're doing it, we need to figure out how collectively to do it tenfold. It makes a difference and you ought to keep at it. Yeah, when we were discussing the session, we were saying, you know, if, I wonder if the people in this room really realize how ripe it is now for this room to become the new Main Street. Uh, we, we really tend to like, I think we've, we, the way this industry started, certainly Mindy's one of the pioneers, and you know how, and my good friend Hazel's a pioneer, a lot of us have been doing this for a long time, and it's time to step back and go, wow, we sort of did that. Now it's the next order of magnitude that we can tackle, and that's what I think Sirius has been leading us towards and legitimating these conversations. Now, I want to touch on one other thing uh, before we do questions. That, that's, it was interlaced in Mindy's comments, and it's really important in the world I live in, and that's climate change. And, and I'm, I'm going to just touch for a moment on, I think most of you know about Richard Mueller's and uh, he, the professor from Berkeley who wrote that op-ed piece in the New York Times a couple weeks ago. He was funded, it was a two-year study uh, by the Koch brothers. Uh, they funded it because he was a very famous, the last legitimate climate denier, I would argue. And so he did this kind of great piece in the New York Times where he said not only, and he, he, he did an analysis of CO2, and he saw a one-to-one -one correlation to the rise of CO2, which by the way is probably over 400 parts per million as we speak today. He saw the rise in CO2, and he said, wow, I conclusively have proven to myself, no, it's tied to the heating of the planet, it's a one-to-one -one correlation, so there's two things I now know that I didn't believe before. One, climate change is real for sure, and two, it's caused by humans. And then he proceeded to say how it would be a terrible problem within the next 50 years. Now the problem with that assessment, and I'm grateful that he did it, was he left three major aspects completely out of the study, which is compounding the velocity of climate change. So he did CO2, but he didn't do the off-gassing of methane from the permafrost, which upon initial release is at least 40 to 50 times more destructive and heats the environment more than CO2. Dissipates quicker, but heats faster. He, he completely left out the albedo effect, which is the fact that now the Arctic in the north, the pole, isn't there in the, in the summer anymore. So the sun's rays that used to hit and bounce off the snow mass back into the, up into the space doesn't bounce back anymore. You have parts of the Arctic today that are seven to, nine, seven to nine degrees hotter than they were just five years ago. He also left out the enormous effect of what's called the upwellings, hydrate releases of gases that have been trapped since the volcanic era are gurgling up and being charted now uh, by the Monterey Aquarium off the, the coast of California and by another organization in the North Sea. So these compounding effects means that not only does the planet have a fever today, the fever's getting worse on its own and we're pouring gas on the fire. We're making it hotter still. So one of the things we wanted to bring out for the group today is we'd like you to start thinking about the immediacy of the threat to the capital base of a company that isn't really thinking about the impact of climate change in every single industry. And you want to just comment on that a little bit, Mindy? Well, it, it, you know, Nick Stern, who did the, sort of the largest economic study on climate change, said something about uh, the impacts of climate change will make the subprime meltdown look small. That's a pretty bold statement. On the other hand, it hasn't been challenged, and that report's been out there for five or six years. It's only been supported. When we look at, again, just the past year, the past two years, $32 billion hit to the insurance sector, property and casualty, which I just mentioned. Agricultural companies getting annihilated from not enough water. The weather changes, killing crops, killing ca cattle. There is almost no economic sector that is not damaged. I mean, we need to collectively think about how to make that economic case, and it's there and work together, but to bring it to the financial leaders and to the companies and how are you integrating climate into what you do? Think about the insurance industry. 
they are the risk assessors of the world. When they change how you model risk, the whole world changes how they model risk. They've got all the best risk assessors. They're still not modeling risk for climate change. They're still looking in the rear view mirror at times rather than looking forward, which will be a very different world. Think about what the insurance sector could do if they change how they price products. If they say, we're going to charge you more for B&O and D&O insurance, director's insurance, if you're a company that's not looking at climate change. We think it's a risk. We want you to address as a fiduciary that risk, and we want you to look for opportunities. Or think about what an insurance company could do right now if they price products. For those of us who drive very little, 2,000 miles a year rather than the average 12,000, I can't buy insurance that costs less and that encourages me to drive less, but we need to start seeing that. So one sector alone, if we think about how to collectively engage that sector on changing their modeling, changing the pricing of their products, half of, them are an inv half of most insurance companies are an investment firm, so getting them to integrate sustainability metrics into their investment side, and then being our voice or a voice on policy, we can make enormous pro progress, but we need to collectively prevail upon them. I know um, Rob is here from my office. I know there's a large group of investors who are working to get investors to just do better GRI reports, so they're at least measuring their risk and disclosing it. They will do that if all of you say, what are you doing to address this cataclysmic risk that will face every part of our economy? So in some of the most unsuspecting places, there are huge opportunities because this is a fundamental economic driver. And again, we could go in one direction towards a fossil fuel future, or we could go towards a clean energy future. And if we don't go towards a clean energy future, I mean, we're bringing literally the kind of emissions that we as a planet can't absorb anymore. So not only does it change the, literally the future of our children, but of every economic sector we face. So, but one example. Another example, when you're engaging with companies and you all do that more than anyone else, it should no longer be about good disclosure. Transparency is great, engaging with stakeholders are great. Companies should do a disclosure report, a good one. But it has to be about changing practices from the boardroom to the supply chain where it matters. It has to get integrated. One-off deals no longer ought to be what we're about. We've got to look at the complexity and look at the full process when we work with companies. Dell's been great. Most of the companies uh, in the room have been great at thinking about how do you bring these issues to the boardroom? How do you set goals? How do you compensate people for those goals? How do you start looking at what you're putting in your products? If we don't have enough rubber in five years, we better be making tires differently and sneakers differently and so on. Those are the forces you, of change. I, this is a good example. I, I, I had the good fortune. I was asked uh, to do a, a day um, talk with the top leadership of BMW globally. So there's the guy sitting there from BMW of India, BMW of China, et cetera, et cetera, the guy who runs the Mini Cooper division there. And um, I asked them, what business are you in? And, and, and of course, they want to tell you that they're, they build the ultimate driving machine. And I said, well, you know, that's a little bit narrow. Some of you think you'd build cars, but why, why don't you think of yourselves as being in the personal transportation system? That's what you're doing, personal transportation system. They all sort of agreed. I go, now, how are you going to be in that business if by definition in 15 years there won't be enough roads to take all the cars from everybody that's building cars today? Which, by the way, is true. There are, well, today, if we continue, if everybody keeps the same market share, there'll be no roads that you can drive on in China or India and, and most parts of the United States because the volume of cars going on the road is exceeding the ability of roads to carry them. So I asked them, if you just thought about that, what is personal transportation in the next decade, not what was it back in 1950, all of a sudden you get this whole different viewpoint. And you start going, well, gee, that's true. I mean, if GM makes as many as Ford, if it makes Chrysler and Toyota, yeah, where are they going to fit them all? And that starts a new kind of thinking in industry. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is that's something I got to do between yeah, annual reports. And I would like to urge you, we're going to do some questions in a minute, I'd like to urge you to look at not waiting till the annual meeting to start the conversation. Like, send a, a company you've got even a small interest of investment in. Send, uh, to, it's always best to address this to the, uh, the CEO, he'll give it to the general counsel. Send them a letter saying, you know, I'm really curious what you're going to be reporting 
on your climate change disclosures on the 10K this year. You know, you have no idea how that changes the conversation in the company. Because then the general counsel has to up, he has to abide on it. <laughs> now we're going to have a conversation. And it's going to get to the board level if it doesn't get to be a good conversation. And just stay with those companies that are trying to do the right thing and help prod them along. I mean, of all the people in this room, I wonder how many of the Fortune 100 best companies to work for in America you keep will invest in. These are the companies that are doing the best things for their employees. Are you looking down that list to see who you can help do something even better with? You know, I'm, I'm delighted that my company, Men's Warehouse, has been on that list now for more than a decade. And I'd feel terrible if we fell off that list. But we're not doing enough. And we're not hearing from folks in this room as much as we, clearly, as you hear from the traditional Wall Street view. So my, uh, my plea to you, and something that Mindy and I agree we both have in common, is if you see these issues as really serious, i.e. climate change is not a minor problem anymore. And by the way, don't give yourself the comfort of believing that the international climate panels are telling you what the risk is because that's a politically derived conclusion. Most of the people on those climate panels see the situation as far more severe than what they're allowed to report because of the politics of how they collect the reports. So the climate change issues are enormous. They're a threat to capital. Uh, the opportunities are enormous. That's the Marshall Plan opportunity for capital that wants to deploy itself in industries and companies of the future. So what are the sunrise opportunities and how do we help those folks as much as apart from the sunset companies that we've talked about today? So that's really the context for this conversation. We'd love to have people come. There's microphones on either side. And if there's any questions, all we ask is keep your comments brief uh, and your questions brief. And we'd love to hear from the audience. Hi there, thanks. Dr. Muller, uh, the Koch brothers scientist, came on to Fareed Zakaria's program and repeated his assertions that now humans are responsible for global warming. But then he moved on to say that that means that we should go into a transitional energy source like natural gas. And he pushed that quite hard. And he neglected to mention that the Koch brothers are beginning to transition from coal to natural gas. Just thought I'd mention it. <laughs> and good to mention, indeed. Yeah. yeah. On that one, by the way, uh, we, the Academy sees natural gas as a transition fuel, even though we're adamantly opposed to fracking. So um, if somebody says they're going to stop burning coal, which now, as you probably know, uh, 52, 53 percent of the American electricity was created with coal uh, as recently as a couple of years ago. Now it's down to 36 percent. Now, I don't like fracking, but I like the idea that coal plants are being reduced. Even the railroads, by the way, CSX is getting hurt real bad because it's not carrying as much coal. And they didn't see that coming. So a shareholder of CSX could have warned them about that. So the natural gas phenomenon, even though we're very much against fracking, is something to be aware of. And it's interesting as a transition fuel. But clearly, the future is probably hydrogen. And we can talk a lot about that later. Yes, ma'am. Oh, over here, sir. Terry. Yeah, uh, Ronaldo and Mindy. Uh, I've been involved with this industry since the 1970s. And since then, our, our focus has been on the secondary priorities of companies, asking companies to care more about the community, more about the environment, more about, the, uh, uh, about labor. Um, I'm part of a group here called Common Good Investing Community that now believes we need to focus on the highest priority. In other words, right now, most people in these corporate boards, Mindy, they think that their obligation is to give priority to the financial interests of a few called the shareholders. That is fundamentally immoral. We all know that moral behavior is when you freely choose to give priority to the common good. So what we're advocating is that we need to call them to account to say, is your highest priority the common good or is it anything else? You can't just say that you're incorporated in Delaware and use that as an excuse to get out of this responsibility. So I want to ask you particularly, Mindy, since you've been involved with the research and all of this, how do you see as the possibility of the corporate leaders beginning to realize that as a member of the human society, by nature, their highest priority is the common good and their second priority is profit. They can do both 100%. In fact, they can do both better by changing the priorities. Do you have some thoughts on that? So you may or may not like this comment. Um, and I agree with you completely, by the way. So believe me, I, I, I'm from the Willie Sutton School of Advocacy. You know, people, why did Willie Sutton rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Why do we go after the economic implications of sustainability? Because I think that's where the clout and the power and the honesty of data. So I think changing the conversation is hard enough by saying, 
As a fiduciary, you've got to consider the risks um, that we're all talking about. Um, but arguing them from a financial perspective, because the financial perspective is real, whether it's the labor atrocities that we're all fighting or the environmental, it resonates with that community, with the capital markets community. So in some ways, I'm going to their space. I think we can move them if we talk their language. Again, we ought not change our principles one iota. We could not share the end goals more. Uh, but when we do training of corporate boards or when I'm sitting with CEOs, as do many of you, um, I feel like I will lose traction in five minutes if I talk about the public good. But if I could show them their industry is literally going to be at risk if they're not factoring in human rights and environmental catastrophes and the kinds of things we're talking about, I think we've got a better shot. So it's tactics and strategies, not goals. Uh, and frankly, you know, as a young lawyer, I used to worry about should I be a litigator or an organizer. I, I don't think there is one tactic or strategy that works. I think they work when there's a big pile on. So keep saying that. I'm not suggesting not to, but the, the constant response is, well, I've got this duty to, you know, get good results for my shareholders, which is why, again, I think we want to push out quarterly earnings. So you've got the right mission. Uh, it is hard to move general counsels of Fortune 50 companies with that argument. If you don't mind me responding to that, I agree with your tactics and I support it and I understand, just like you agree and with I my fundamental sure. philosophy. What I am suggesting is something that is not something that you could participate in right now in what you're doing. But we need to come from the total territory and create a movement. A movement like the civil rights movement is when a group gets up and says what has been an acceptable social tradition is now declared to be immoral, treating blacks different than whites or women different than men. We need to build a common good movement that says giving priority to self-interest is immoral. Dick you can Curry. do both, but you can't. And so that's got to come from the broad community. You've got to stay doing what you're doing. Terry, I think that um, that's true, and, and I'd be a part of that movement. I am part of that movement. But I think what Mindy's saying, and I really agree with it because I have to deal with this every day, is you, that can be what motivates you. But when you come talk to me at Men's Warehouse, for example, what I used to say was, hey, you know, we got to look at the labor practices overseas because it could destroy shareholder value if something crazy happened in another country that we thought was okay. Oh, and by the way, we all saw what happened to Foxconn this year. Okay, And that's a, a brand, Apple, that everybody thought was pristine. So my point to you would be, and I think Mindy's right, pick on the company's possibility for improvement, not from your motivation and mine, the broad common good, but from what will actually help them do a better job of protecting their shareholders, their employees, and their other stakeholders. And I think you'll get, you'll get further with that approach, even if the movement's the same for us. But let me go to the next question, only because we, we've got limited time. Yeah, greetings. I really appreciate your uh, activities, Ronaldo and Mindy. And Mindy, I want to harken back to the series conference that you had in Oakland a bunch of years ago, where you basically not only presented the financial um, profile of the cost uh, to San Francisco Bay Area if indeed the uh, global warming had reached 400, which apparently it has now, but that we will soon apparently have, uh, I don't know, hundreds of billions of dollars of, of, of money that is lost as a result of uh, 22 foot sea, you know, sea level rise and the costs of that. But I also want to kind of broaden the discussion to say that this is a movement and we yeah. are representatives of a movement, we in this audience, and that we have some serious personal responsibilities as people, as members of that human family, that we must go on a personal fossil fuel diet. You know, we are, we are going to be modeling, you know, whatever it is that we believe. So I haven't had a car in 20 years. Yeah. I use public transportation. I use local food. I invest in local food and farming infrastructure. So basically, there's this serious chasm called the loss of fossil fuels. We, in 650 bil million years, we've spent all that, that uh, uh, photosynthesized, fossilized sunlight you know, in 312 years. So now, 
the, the boost that this group needs to take to put in renewable energy, the diet that we each personally in our organizations and in our modeling needs to do to not use fossil fuels is really critical. And I'd really appreciate, you know, art, you know, that business of, you know, showing the, the, the line in New York of how high the water will come and, and all of those other things be part of this movement and this group. And I'd like to have you from that other side of your brain, your personal side, your member of the human family side, come up with the coolest thing that you've seen recently that does that and, and basically spark that in a holistic way of dealing with this global crisis. Great. Well, that's wonderfully inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Hi, my name is Larissa Ruoff. I'm the Director of Shareholder Advocacy for Green Century Capital Management. And I just wanted to thank Mindy um, because Green Century, along with our allies at Trillium Asset Management, um, who sub-advise our, our Green Century Balance Fund, worked with um, series to produce an op-ed in support of the wind production tax credit. And that was a phenomenal opportunity and I, I just wanted to reiterate that I do think it's so important for investors to be involved in that way and make it abundantly clear that Ceres is a phenomenal resource for this. I know a lot of investors get really intimidated as to how they can get involved and just wanted to kind of give a personal testimony that uh, Ceres makes it really easy. So you should definitely um, go to them. It is critically important for investors to weigh in on these issues and they're our resources out there if you do want to get involved. Thank you. And it is a partnership. Not, not a single thing that we're talking about has been done without us working collectively, which is the greatest joy of the kind of work that we do. So just you want to take one minute or two? We're going to wrap up, Mindy. Just I think we're about out of time. Sure. So I, I, I see Tim, and I, and I wanted to speak to an issue. The challenges we face are, are, are substantial. And they're about power and leverage and politics. You know, several people in this room, and um, just looking at Tim Smith, who is certainly one of my heroes amongst many, many others in this room, uh, have taken on political spending. We've got a cockamamie, that's a technical legal term, <laughs> Supreme Court decision that says corporations are people and they can spend whatever they want on politics, on political campaigns, on issue campaigns. And we are faced with billions of dollars, Ronaldo talked about the Koch brothers, but Koch brothers times hundreds, making the case that fossil fuel industry is doing exactly what we need to have done. So we've got to think about the fundamentals that are stopping us from being able to get the values and the kind of changes we need. So I would urge everybody to think about, one is some of the fundamental political battles that we're fighting and get involved, because until we change that dynamic, until companies who could outspend every one of us, and they've got a right to now, until there's limits there, um, we're going to have lopsided debates and battles on every issue that we're talking about. Um, but then again, when we get, so moving forward on dealing with the political and the systemic issues can't be ignored, whether it's quarterly earnings and if we want to change policy or policy discussions um, or the SEC, those are the things we have to work on collectively. But then when you're working with companies, it is about the risk throughout the food chain. It ought not to be about, let's just meet with companies on, are they filing a sustainability report? But what are they putting in that report that speaks to the material issues of how they're going to change and how do we make sure those discussions come up year after year after year? And how do we push the argument or, or the elegant discussions that Renato is talking about of what is the future opportunities rather than just the risks. Why ought auto companies not be thinking about car sharing programs? Uh, the car sharing companies are big businesses. They are growing. They are part of our future where people in Brookline and Boston, the number of people who've said, I don't need a car, I can go use one of the two car sharing companies and get a car for two hours or four hours. There's no reason that the large auto companies shouldn't be thinking about how to deliver transportation differently. There are models everywhere. We need to make sure that the capital market players continue to exist. You're all investing in them. But how do we make those investments about future and opportunity and get them out of the risks 
that really do threaten your investments as well as the rest of the world and the future of our kids. So um, and what I'd like the takeaway to be from my point of view is that um, part of what I think we had to say is sort of like a Paul Revere comment. Things are happening that we have to be extremely alert to that are huge risks to capital bases and to corporations. And the other half is this really positive, upbeat awareness that you have more power now than you can imagine. There are new tools at your disposal, like the SEC rules. There's a new receptivity in the boardrooms because they know that this climate change thing is real and they don't know what quite to do about it. You're gonna have to push them a little to think about it some more. But there's a new opening here for this industry to become the new Main Street because that's in fact what you are. And remember, Mark Rubita said it first, don't ever doubt that a small group of committed people can change the course of human history. That's all it ever has. So thank and you very much. And you have. And I mean, change the, the course. The message is you, you have. have. <laughs> and more to come. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Margaret.